Today, okay. Peter will be talking about COVID-19 vaccinations. The title of his presentation is Will Vaccination End the Pandemic? And as you know, the ECB produces quarterly forecasts of the economy. Uh, the evolution of the pandemic has, of course, become a key ingredient uh, of our forecast since its outbreak. A key input, indeed, is to arrive at the growth path of the economy um, by looking at the speed of vaccinations and its impact on the pandemic. So we very much look forward to learning today from Peter whether vaccinations will indeed end the pandemic. The format of Peter's talk is as follows. Peter will give a short presentation of about 30 minutes and the remaining time will be interview based. You can direct your questions to Peter to the host of the meeting via the chat function, which is the fifth button at the bottom of your screen. I will then collect your questions and post them to Peter. I should say that I apologize in advance if I cannot get to your question because of time constraints. Peter, on behalf of the ECB and its executive board, um, some of which are on the call already, it's a great pleasure to have you with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Luc, and uh, good morning, uh, everybody from London, where I'm working remotely from home. And um, I'm uh, always impressed by central banks because of the uh, you know, the, the very serious uh, research you're doing. And one of the things that you may not expect from us, but uh, London School, we, we probably employ the largest group of health economists or economists of health in, in any academic institution in the world. But also, we have about 100 mathematical models. And I'm sure you must also have plenty of them. Um, most of them have a mathematics or physics background, but quite a few also economics. And uh, so um, we've worked, uh, we've been working with some national uh, banks um, and trying to, well, to go beyond the crystal ball forecasting uh, with this epidemic, which is not so, so easy. And the question here, of course, that, uh, uh, that all occupies us, uh, when will this crisis uh, end? And, um, and the first question is, of course, to define what do we mean by, um, you know, by end. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's not a philosophical question, but, uh, um, and as I will uh, go into this for vaccines, the primary um, impact will be a decrease in mortality, hospitalization, severe disease, and, but not necessarily that the virus will stop circulating. And I'll come back to that. But also, um, you could argue in some countries, in uh, Southeast Asia and in East Asia and in uh, like in uh, in New Zealand, at the moment life is fairly normal. Um, and for example, in Singapore, uh, as of uh, Monday, uh, uh, people will uh, go back to their offices. And uh, my uh, my elder son lives in Laos. Uh, they had less than ten deaths, and life is completely normal. Except you can't get in or out of the country. And the same is true in New Zealand. So, and the question is, how long is that sustainable? Um, but um, what I'll do is to uh, give very briefly overview, what are the vaccines and so where are we, without going into too many technical details. And then um, what will it take to indeed bring this epidemic under control? Um, ending it, uh, just like to remind everybody, there is only one human virus, virus that infects humans, that has been eliminated, eradicated, and that's smallpox. Um, that's now about 30 plus years ago. Um, and uh, that's it. And uh, so we should be um, be under no illusion what, what we can achieve, certainly in the, in the short term. Now, I think it's fair to say that in most of continental Europe, um, we are entering, um, I would say, a third wave. You can see here on the left side the um, reported daily cases of uh, COVID. In the first um, peak is, uh, you know, is a, clearly an underestimate because there was the testing capacity was uh, very low, um, and that was in the spring. And now uh, we got into another peak between. Uh, October and um, and December, um, with uh, if you can see here on 
every day about 300,000 people in Europe were infected. This is uh, Europe beyond also the EU, so that includes the UK and, uh, and some of the so-called neighborhood, as I've, I'm learning uh, EU speak now. Um, and, um, and then we were on the really uh, going, it was going quite well, thanks to the uh, lockdowns and all the measures, uh, social distancing and masks and, and so on. Um, but now uh, there is a rebound. And there's a rebound that um, we, um, you know, and we're in some countries, an increase of 30 to 50% in one week of the number of cases. And that's not due this time to uh, increased testing, but is a genuine increase. It is driven um, mostly by a so-called variant, a, a, a virus strain that is more infectious. I'll come back to that also. And that originated in Kent in, the, in England, um, and which was brought under control in England thanks to a pretty draconian lockdown. Uh, so that's the good news is it's possible to do that but um, it's this variant plus uh, a premature relaxation of the measures that means that we are uh, going into uh, yeah, this new wave and uh, while vaccination has not been rolled out sufficiently. You look here at the, the deaths, um, you know, um, COVID-19 is the second cause of death in, um, in Europe. It was the first cause of death by the end of the year, of last year. So it's not a marginal phenomenon because to those deaths, you should um, add um, deaths from other diseases, but uh, in people who could not access healthcare because hospitals are overwhelmed, are restricted uh, in terms of uh, what they can do. And so there is quite some good evidence that there is an increase in, in deaths also from stroke, um, uh, heart attacks and, and even cancer. Uh, so it is a quite, a, uh, you know, when we think of the impact, as you know very well as economists, um, this we should look beyond the, um, you know, the immediate, uh, the direct cost and the direct deaths. Next slide, please. Um, so the uh, European Centre for Disease Control, um, which is a, um, an entity of the European Union based in Stockholm, and um, has just uh, recently um, developed and, and made available a, um, you know, what they call a COVID-19 forecast hub, where um, various uh, modeling um, exercises from various groups are being put in, uh, you know, in that database and uh, by country with forecasts. And um, of course, as you can see here, as you all know, the uh, uncertainty range of the forecast, of course, increases over time. And um, the, the various models um, don't always agree. However, in general, I would say that the, uh, the current uh, third wave was fairly accurately predicted by most um, mathematical models. And because of the, uh, as soon as this variant uh, came up from, uh, from England, uh, because that variant is 70%, up to 70% more transmissible. So you have, in a sense, a bit of an epidemic in the epidemic and a virus that is taking over, um, which complicates life tremendously. And there are other variants in other parts of the world. Again, I come back to it. It's also uh, increasing mortality. This is all work by the London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine. And um, so... I'm not suggesting that, uh, for example, I, I just took Germany, since you're based in Germany, that we will go that path. As you know, there is a, uh, the worst case scenario is not always, uh, or usually not what we see here. Plus it assumes that the, um, you know, that the measures will be relaxed. However, um, it should uh, give us some pause to uh, reflect that we're certainly not out of the woods. And also, when you take a bit of a longer term uh, modeling uh, until the end of the year, most models predict uh, in the autumn, winter, another increase, but um, much less because of vaccination, fewer deaths. And that is to do with, uh, with seasonality. Um, as we all have experienced in our life during when it's getting colder, we get a cold, as it's called. And, um, you know, because we spend more time in closed uh, 
uh, you know, uh, rooms and, uh, um, you know, we have, we interact much closer to country, to people and also the um, um, viruses, our response, our immunity, uh, defense against viruses is less effective. So that's a bit uh, for the time being, but it's a really good uh, resource there and uh, you can play with it and extend it uh, the time and so on. Next slide, please. Um, now, going to the right. So the situation is serious again. Uh, we all had hoped that by the spring uh, we would could be able to relax and uh, without this variant that would have been the case. But uh, um, the viruses uh, are have one purpose in life when you think of it there is no that of a virus is survival is eternal life and is finding um, a host and that means a living cell be it a plant a animal or a uh, human being because viruses cannot survive and multiply without living cells they actually parasitize they use our um, machinery to multiply and to uh, then find another host so uh, this is uh, what uh, this, uh, the race between the virus trying to multiply and escape the, you know, the uh, evolutionary pressure that we're putting on there and, uh, and then uh, our control measures. In Europe, there are four uh, vaccines that have been uh, approved by the European Medicines Agency, as you know, is the first one was the BioNTech Pfizer vaccine. Uh, this is the Moderna vaccine from an American startup. Um, we have the um, Oxford and AstraZeneca vaccine and Janssen, uh, Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine. These are all approved and they're roughly um, equally effective when it comes to preventing death and, uh, um, you know, and severe disease. Uh, the, um, uh, interestingly here is that two of these vaccines, the um, BioNTech uh, developed and the Moderna developed vaccines are completely new. Never before have they been um, made available because they use directly a technology called uh, of messenger RNA. So you inject, in a sense, the genetic code of the, uh, the spike protein, which then the body fools the body and the body thinks it's a natural infection and creates this immunity. And I think this will be a, the start of a whole new generation of, uh, of vaccines. Uh, uh, as we all know, this has been, um, these vaccines have been made in record time, in less than a year. Normally it takes, uh, just to remind you, about 10 years at least to develop a vaccine and sometimes you no know, much longer. For example, HIV, which is actually killing still uh, close to, you know, uh, a million people a year um, and was discovered in 1983, uh, we still don't have a vaccine because there the virus is so smart and changes so much that uh, it's difficult. So we've been lucky that a uh, vaccine was uh, possible biologically against the coronavirus. Can I have the next one? Um, and um, these vaccines are not only have been shown to be effective in clinical trials, but also uh, the real world uh, effectiveness is also high because that's not always the case. Often the real world effectiveness is lower than uh, when you do a neat study and you know and you eliminate all the you know the things that you don't like and that you want to have a proof of concept now here uh, and the, the first data came from israel the country that has had the fastest deployment um, with over uh, 60 percent of people in israel uh, in fact uh, vaccinated now um, and that in no time and all with the same vaccine the biotech pfizer vaccine and um, i won't go into the the, the details here but the Effectiveness, um, uh, even after one dose, was already 70%. And that's confirmed by data from Scotland, from England, and from smaller groups in, um, in the US. Uh, and soon we'll see more and more of that. So basically, you can hardly say it just eliminates nearly 100% death, uh, hospitalization, and severe disease, which means that the burden of disease is uh, going to be much, much less. Next slide. However, the um, Vaccination coverage, as you know very well, and uh, it's uh, become one of the big political and geopolitical issues of our time, uh, including last uh, yesterday on the, on the European Council. Um, this very uneven um, deployment and supply of vaccines. On the left upper side, you see, uh, and this is another source of information. There's the uh, the vaccine center of the 
London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine has a, a daily update of a vaccine tracker. And so you can see here the percentage of uh, um, population uh, uh, that is being covered. Um, over 60% now in Israel, the UK is at um, about 45% now. United Arab Emirates uh, using uh, Chinese vaccines um, is also uh, very good, uh, well placed. And the US is moving very rapidly. As you may have heard yesterday, uh, President Biden announced that 200 million vaccinations will be given in the first 100 days. He said vaccinations. That means that uh, um, not uh, everybody will be fully covered, but uh, this is a, a major effort. Also, interestingly, that Chile is doing very well uh, in this. Uh, nearly all um, European countries are lagging behind, and it's um, there's a big issue on supply. That's for sure. You know all the the troubles with AstraZeneca, which is not honouring the um, the contract made with the Commission, um, and only delivering about 20 to 30 percent at the most. And uh, many countries have based their strategy on that vaccine because it's easier to administer and uh, the supply chain and uh, the price. Um, but uh, the um, but there's also the fact that when you look at it uh, through this um, the buyers club to say so of the commission, uh, 88 million doses have been distributed to member states, but only 62 million have been given. So there is like um, 26 million that are hanging there. Uh, some of that you need a reserve to give the second dose. That's that's uh, good uh, management, but. Um, Many countries have started far too late with the, uh, you know, with their vaccine plans and deployments, and uh, and which is amazing. Even if the Commission had uh, already in July and then in October again um, issued some recommendations for, yeah, people get ready. So it is uh, not only supply, but it's uh, supply and logistics and the commitment plus. Um, there is also some other issues that uh, I'll come back, like vaccine confidence. However, um, the situation is uh, far worse in uh, low and middle income countries, particularly low income countries, where um, only recently have vaccines arrived. The next slide, please, through a mechanism called COVAX. COVAX uh, is a, um, an alliance uh, as part of the anti-COVID -COVID, uh, um, tools accelerated accelerator you see on the left side and on the right side COVAX um, and which was launched by President von der Leyen in on the 4th of May and uh, now is managed by uh, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation which was launched uh, after the Ebola outbreaks in West Africa which killed about 11,000 people but was limited to three countries but paralyzed these three countries for over a year uh, Liberia, Sierra Leone and uh, uh, Guinea and the mining sector was very heavily uh, affected there. Um, and uh, so that is uh, uh, CEPI, as it's called, is there to develop vaccines where there was market failure against Ebola, but came in very uh, rapidly. I'm a, a board member and uh, uh, already during the World Economic Forum in Davos uh, now um, uh, two years, no, last year, um, we issued the first contracts and that was around the 20th of, uh, of January. So before that, we were certain that this would become such a bad uh, issue. Then it's also Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance and the World Health Organization. So their goal is to provide uh, vaccines, to fund vaccines for particularly low income countries. Um, and uh, the money is starting to come. Uh, it's not enough, but they've started to deploy vaccines. There the problem is, uh, uh, supply and one of the big issues now are uh, export uh, bans in uh, India, uh, but also the US uh, with the, the uh, Defense Act, which uh, prohibits the export of any material that can be used for uh, vaccine uh, uh, manufacturing. And uh, so even Indian companies depend on that. At the same time, uh, the African Union has started to negotiate with companies. And uh, so I think that the um, the issue today is not so much money, but it's supply. And this is not just a, let's say, a moral issue, um, you know, in terms of ec global equity and uh, quality. But the, the reality is also that no country is safe unless every country is safe. 
if, if we if we vaccine if we're all vaccinated we could become like in new zealand close all the borders and so on in europe forget it um but also um, what's happening if there are millions of people infected with the virus that will be a breeding ground for um you know um for variants to for mutations to come up and, and I'll, I'll move to that now um the next slide please yeah being belgian i like to show the name Magritte. um so where are we going and the next slides please um the first question is will vaccination work and i put vaccination rather than vaccines because uh, vaccination is the act of uh, yeah uh, of uh, of immunizing people and uh, the first question here is uh, will they work against new variants? And I'll come back to the next slide. But there are many unknowns. How long will they protect us? Is it one year, two years, five years? Yeah, we have like measles vaccine. That's uh, as a child, you get it. You're protected for the rest of your life. For influenza, uh, for the flu, every year we need another shot because there is a new variant coming up. Um, so that's the first unknown and uh, time will tell. Uh, are they safe? I think the answer is now safely we can say yes. Um, because we have now close to um, well over 100 million people have been vaccinated in the world and um, there will always be side effects. Um, I was vaccinated yesterday, I got my second dose of the Pfizer one. All I have is a bit of a sore arm, but there was this scare of uh, thromboembolic events, uh, particularly in women uh, after the AstraZeneca vaccine, but uh, the European Medicines Agency was very firm with no evidence that this was caused by it. Um, and uh, in Norway, they had some people who died, but then it turned out they were very uh, frail, uh, very old people uh, in care homes who, yeah, with the, uh, the death rate was not higher than you would expect. Um, but number four is really, as at the moment, is a huge bottleneck. Will there be enough? The supply is definitely not there. But in all fairness, this has never been tried before. One, um, to develop a vaccine in 10 months, 12 months, um, and then to uh, manufacture billions of it, um, no company has done it. And it's interesting to see that, with the exception of Pfizer, the big vaccine manufacturers, just as JSK, Sanofi, uh, Merck, uh, Merck, Sharp and Dome in the US, they're not uh, involved uh, at the moment uh, in the initial uh, development of these vaccines. They will now start producing and they teamed up like um, JSK with CureVac and uh, Merck is going to produce some of the Janssen vaccines and, and Sanofi, uh, I can't remember, but also another one. So this is supply issue is a huge issue. And, uh, and, and as we, you know, we all know, it's a big, so, uh, you know, political issue. And India is the largest vaccine manufacturer in the world, just that it is for uh, medicines, um, but there uh, they also can't follow at the moment. So, but I think this is a temporary issue. By the end of the year, we may have more vaccines than there are arms in the world. So we have to, so it's really now that the problem is. And there are no easy solutions. Uh, some people, there is the people's vaccine movement. They said, if we just abolish IP, we'll have vaccines everywhere. Now, uh, you should know that there are for, to make a vaccine, there are about 300 to 400 steps. And with all, with the patent, but it's mostly technology and it's, it's like you have, a, I love cooking, so you can have a cookbook of a, a three Michelin star chef. Uh, that doesn't mean you can make the same meal. And so safety and quality assurance are really, really key. So, but there are uh, moves for um, local manufacturing, like in, in Africa, for example, in, in uh, Dakar, in the Institut Pasteur de Dakar, the, um, uh, they're producing already a yellow fever vaccine on the market. And that is really, um, they prove that they can do it. And that could be the foundation of, a, uh, you know, of vaccine manufacturing. Brazil has some also, uh, and of course in Asia, I wouldn't be worried about that. And then the last point is, will people accept them? There is a growing movement of what uh, a neutral term calls vaccine hesitancy or vaccine confidence. Uh, it's very unequal, but in Europe, it is very strong. In, country like France and Poland and uh, Bulgaria, um, even among healthcare workers, among doctors, and, uh, and, and this could derail completely the impact of vaccination. Next slide, please. Just an interlude here on the, um, uh, the so-called variants. What is a variant? It's, a, it's the same virus, but it is 
undergone mutations, which uh, every virus does all the time. It's like a, an error in their multiplication. So that's a random phenomenon. But now and then that error gives them an evolutionary uh, advantage so that they're more transmissible and will take over from their competing viruses. Now, coronavirus is not too bad. Influ uh, influenza virus, they mutate like at double the pace. And HIV is like when you're infected with and living with HIV, you can have 100,000 different viruses in your body. And so that's why we have problems. So do this uh, um, vaccines work against the variants? And we know that for the British variant, it's fine. Uh, to make a long story short, no difference with um, the original um, uh, you know, virus. For the South African one, which is now um, invading quite a few countries, um, there, the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine showed only 10% um, efficacy. In other words, it's not working. Um, but the Novavax, not yet on the market, was a decrease. But the Janssen, the J&J vaccine, was, um, you know, was highly effective against severe disease and hospitalization, a bit less against uh, mild infection. So here we see a difference in, among vaccines. Um, and that's why in Africa now they're very keen to have the Janssen vaccine also because it requires only one injection. Next slide, please. Now, this is a, a huge challenge and, uh, we, and what we don't know is will people require, just as for influenza, a regular booster vaccine, uh, vaccination, so against new variants. How many variants will there be? Is there a defined spectrum? Can we predict that? We will be using uh, AI and machine learning to try to, to see, uh, you know, what is the system there. And that's very important for, for industry. And what all these companies are now working on already on the second generation of uh, vaccines. And this is where the, uh, the commission has really uh, uh, come up uh, to speed with the, together with industry, but also uh, the EMA and uh, uh, the ECDC. And this is called the HERA incubator. Um, HERA for um, Health Emergency Preparedness and Response Authorities, which is a proposal for later, because clearly we as EU, we were not prepared. Also, as you know, health is not a competency, a legal competency of the EU. And uh, uh, the Commission could have said, OK, fine, it's not our competency, but that is, of course, not an option. And it's, of course, I don't think the EU should have competency in health care and all that. Every country is so specific. It goes back for centuries in Germany to Bismarck, you know, you don't want to mess with that. However, with the, um, you know, for when it comes to pandemics, cross-border issues are so important. And also uh, the, the US, for example, has an instrument called BARDA that has invested about $12 billion, billion dollars in the development of vaccines. We didn't have that. And that put us in a, a weaker position. And so, uh, again, to make a long story short, uh, there is a whole program now and in close contact with industry, but also regulatory fairs so that we can have fast tracking of uh, uh, these much needed new vaccines. Next slide. So when I'm coming to the more to the end now, um, the future of the pandemic, when you take the long term view, it will vary by country, of course, and depends on many factors. I mean, is the societal and public health responses, and that's going to be more and more difficult, I think. There's, enormous, let's say, coronavirus fatigue, um, plus the economic impact is enormous, vaccine coverage, and then the, all the issues that I mentioned, duration of uh, immunity, seasonality, future mutations of the virus. And can I have the next slide? I think that the, um, I mean, these are very simplistic uh, models, but uh, based on pretty sophisticated work. And uh, so you could have, first of all, nearly all experts agree that we're not going to get rid of this virus like just uh, within our the next few years. Um, however, we will be able to manage it and to live with it. And the question is, will this be like an annual outbreak, like for the flu or every other year or five years? So that's uh, uh, we should know better, I think, after the next winter. Next slide. Um, but it won't be that. And there's a lot of uh, talk about uh, herd immunity. Um, so herd immunity being a the level of immunity in the population that makes that um, you know um, that every that the virus doesn't find enough susceptible individuals to um, you know to infect and then you know the, it will uh, you know fade out 
Um, and that's a combination of vaccine-induced immunity and natural immunity. But uh, again, this is modeling from our school also, but from Adam Kuchask and his uh, group and, and yeah. And, uh, and the, um, it shows that, for example, in the UK, they, you would need to reach 95% vaccine coverage because the vaccines are not perfect. Um, people don't always take them, etc. cetera. Um, so I think that this is gonna be extremely difficult to achieve. Uh, we know that for measles, it's also 93%, but that's for children and we reach that. But if you go below, below for example, people refuse it, you get epidemics. Next slide. So uh, coming to the end, um, so there is a um, quite a movement of uh, zero COVID. People say we should, uh, you know, go. We should not accept anything less than zero COVID. So in other words, zero is means zero. It's not not no COVID. And um, I think that's a real illusion uh, for many reasons that uh, you can see that uh, uh, maybe in the longer term uh, we need to aim for that. But uh, uh, we have to see, and as a society what is acceptable we accept that every year uh, there are depending on the country thousands of people die from influenza um, if we set the bar for COVID to zero um, that will completely paralyze the society but it's it's an appealing um, fact but once you start thinking it through it's not going to uh, be feasible and we'll go more to a uh, uh, you know and so what we call endemic type. next slide um, and uh, so the, um, I think that you have to be optimistic also, but realistic uh, to answer the question, will vaccination um, end the pandemic? I think it will bring it under control, definitely. And uh, we can go not back to normal, but we can go forward to normal. It'll be a kind of a new normal. Uh, and for example, um, I guess that masks and more testing and so on will be part of the system. Uh, digital green certificates, uh, also called vaccine passports, very controversial, but uh, the reality is it's uh, it's already going to be there. Um, so again, I'm not going to go into all this, but um, I think we we will go. Going to have the next one to a um, kind of a, a normal type of life, but with uh, a lot of provisos. So we'll need to continue a number of uh, social distancing and mask wearing um, just like in Japan when you have a cold you just um, you know you wear a mask to protect the community and uh, one of the fascinating things for me is why does some Asian countries and Southeast Asian countries have been so successful in bringing this pandemic under control where uh, using exactly the same measures as Western societies where it's just out of control with 126,000 deaths in, uh, in the UK for example and so probably we need to look at, on the one hand, what governments can impose and what's acceptable in one society or the other. But also, if you have a hyper-individualistic type of uh, um, culture with me, myself and I, that uh, that is really a big friend of the virus. I'll, I'll, um, so we'll need to continue. And the last slide here. And, and this is a question I often get. Uh, um, do we have to choose between the economy or the or health and the answer is actually you can't save the economy if you don't bring this epidemic under control this is a, um, this is already some early research that was published in the financial times which by the way is a very good source of uh, information also for us uh, in public health and uh, so we need to bring this uh, epidemic under control otherwise we can forget the um, you know the economic uh, relance and uh, so the, the, the answer to the question is uh, yes, but, and, uh, and, and not completely, but uh, there's frankly no other way out. Thank you very much. And sorry to speak a bit too long. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, so I will kick off with a few questions from the floor and I will also turn it over a bit later on in the interview to our board members and give them an opportunity to ask you questions as well. So uh, Peter, um, as I said, you're the special advisor to the European Commission on COVID-19 matters. Mm -hmm. You explained to us that the development of vaccines has been extraordinarily impressive, but the rollout of vaccines has been slow for a variety of reasons. Um, the question is, but when do you expect that all adults in Europe will be vaccinated? 
Yeah, that's a key question eh, for uh, for the to go back to the question of the talk. Um, the goal is to uh, have like seventy percent of um, adults vaccinated by uh, the summer I mean, July August. I think that's still feasible, but it requires two things: enough vaccines, but also countries must really uh, accelerate. I mean, like I got my first uh, vaccine here on a Sunday morning. I mean, you need to work seven days uh, a week. Um, and it has to be like a military type of operation and, and with very good uh, communication. Uh, in some countries, um, you know, you have to go first on, online and a website and all that. And uh, that's fine for many people, but uh, the most vulnerable, the most, the oldest one, they may not uh, know how to do that. So we need to, um, to make it people friendly and uh, uh, so it, it is in our hands and it's in the hands of every uh, government. And I don't understand that with this um, new surge that this isn't uh, a national priority in most countries. Uh, Peter, um, in, uh, in the European continent, there are many questions about the effectiveness and especially the side effects of the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, you explained the difference between this vaccine and other vaccines. Are these concerns warranted? Yeah, I think that um, when I uh, hear people who are skeptical about vaccines, you have a hard core of, let's say, anti-vaxxers. And that's because they want natural immunity and they're against this or think it's a conspiracy of the of big pharma and so on. Okay, that's one group, but that's a pretty small group. Then you've got people with legitimate um, questions. You know, indeed, if it normally takes 10 years um, to develop a vaccine, how do you know that this works and that it's safe, particularly if you only spend a, a year on it? So I think that is a very reasonable question. And, uh, but the answer is unequivocally that it is safe. Um, that, um, um, yeah, as I said, we have now about 100 million people. The fact that these thromboembolic events were detected I find is a um, an indication that the monitoring system of uh, monitoring side effects is working. It's uh, and uh, but again, I understand that you know with the, the precaution principle, which is stronger in some countries than in others. In some, it's uh, enshrined in the law; in others, not. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I, uh, but I think that, yeah, I'm. I'm. Um, I would be happy to to take the AstraZeneca vaccine. I think it's. Um, they, they've not helped themselves with uh, their own communication, uh, I must say, but uh, uh, no, I, I, and, and the same is true for the other vaccines on, on the market. And by the way, the, AstraZeneca uses the same or a similar platform, as it's called, to vaccine delivery as Janssen, as the TNG. Um, and, and there also, um, we have experience already of hundreds of thousands of people. So combined, um, no, it's it's fine. I mean, I think, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't hesitate to take it. I mean, that's not a scientific argument, eh? but uh, if if you would, uh, I always think if you make a policy statement and you would not apply it to yourself, then then it's not credible. Eh? <laughs> uh, Peter, uh, you explained that it will be difficult to reach immunity against the virus, explaining that uh, large parts of the world will have low vaccination rates. What about children? Do you see a prospect that they will be vaccinated? Very good question. And uh, ultimately, uh, in terms of uh, bringing it uh, really under control, we will need to vaccinate children as well. Um, because even if children don't get ill, they are playing some role in, um, the tra in transmission. It's quite controversial because it has many practical implications for um, you know, uh, keeping the schools open or not. And, Scientists uh, uh, don't fully agree um, on the immediate risk. And we know, for example, that infection rates in teachers are not higher than in the general population, uh, but children get infected, yeah. Uh, but in you could argue, let's assume all um, adults are vaccinated, but then the virus will just infect, uh, you know, happily as many children as possible. And that is then a source. The, uh, the good news is that the, the vaccines were um, tested in, initially in adults because before you do trials and you test out new medicines and new vaccines in children, 
you want to have uh, you know certainty about the safety particularly of vaccines and um in adults and uh, and, and that passed the test and now uh, you know i expect that in well, a couple of months or so, we will know the results, but I anticipate that it will work with children. Children are far more uh, used to vaccinations than we uh, as adults. Um, but that's a good question. And that means that that's probably only for the end of the year. However, I would say the goal of vaccination today is in the first place, um, you know, eliminate mortality. So people don't die anymore. People don't get into intensive care units, don't be hospitalized and don't have severe disease and then you know um, you can really we can have a pretty we can open societies again thank you um peter we, we understand uh, that a, that a person who has been vaccinated can still fall sick but would be less affected with only light symptoms after taking a vaccine um, do we already know whether a person who has been vaccinated can still contract the virus and infect others yeah, first of all, um, vaccines are not 100% effective. I mean, even like Pfizer and so and uh, Moderna, it's 95, 96%. So that's why exactly we don't know yet. Um, <clears throat> this is new. So it's not 100%. So in rare cases, it may happen. Um, and uh, uh, up to now, indeed, people who became then infected, they their um, disease was much milder. And that's... Uh, but it's still early days because there are also people who get reinfected naturally, uh, particularly uh, there's now quite a few cases in Brazil because there is a variant that seems to be quite different. And, um, and most seem to be milder in, in uh, disease, but some not. So uh, this is open question. But uh, an important question is that uh, when you're vaccinated, it's a, not only vaccination is, is a very interesting. It's both egoistic and altruistic. And it's a win-win, as we would say, you know, you become, um, you know, you're immune, so you're protected. But the question is, do you also shed less virus? Are you less tran likely to transmit? So are you not a risk for others? And here, uh, the data are starting to come in, particularly from Israel. Um, and uh, the answer is that most, most likely, um, and uh, the question is, will this reduce uh, transmission uh, by 50% or 90%? Uh, we, we don't know yet, but my guess it's going to be very high also, because why do virus, the vaccines work? They reduce your vaccine, your virus load, and that's why you get less severe disease. And if you have fewer viruses, you will exhale fewer viruses and uh, infect fewer people. But that's not yet supported by, by the facts. It's just a matter of time. Thank you. Um, some have argued that the virus may be settling into a limited set of mutations or variants, and that vaccines will therefore remain effective. What is your view on this? Yeah, I hope that that's true, uh, but we can't take the risk. No, that uh, I think from an evolutionary perspective, um, that's probably what will happen, but is that how long is going to take? And uh, so a big question, if I were, uh, you know, a vaccine company, I would want to know, are there four or five or 10, uh, you know, significant variants that could influence the effectiveness of my vaccine or only two? Uh, so that's, uh, yeah, but it's, it, yeah. And it's not an all or nothing. When I show this, uh, um, the, the data on the effectiveness of vaccines, um, it's not when you're exposed to another, this new variant that suddenly your vaccine is no longer effective, but it could reduce it. So, yeah, it's, it's uh, I wish I had the answers to all these questions because that's what we're working on very, but they're very, very uh, good questions. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Um, let me um, ask one more question before turning over to uh, the board members on the call. Um, Peter, we understand uh, that you were exposed yourself, yourself to the virus and you just shared with us that you also took the vaccine. Um, do you have any advice for the participants? By the way, we have 140 on the call. Uh, what to do when you get sick with the virus? Yeah, about a year ago, I was in the hospital, indeed. Um, you know, I, I was one of the first uh, here in the UK to, to become infected. and. Uh, 
uh, even after we had already closed our university and uh, work from home. But anyway, I got infected. Uh, I still don't know where. And um, um, yeah, so and I made a mistake of continuing to work. I'm a bit of a workaholic, so that's not. A, I would advise when you get sick, stop working and uh, take good care of yourself and isolate yourself. Um, but um, and and monitor. Um, make sure you know you have a good medical counsel and that you know in case you deteriorate that where to go. What's interesting with this is that um, you don't have to cough or to be short of breath and to be in trouble um, because uh, the that can come later. So in my case, my what we call oxygen saturation. So the fact that your you know your blood uh, and your lungs are not functioning and, and uh, give enough oxygen to your brain and everything, which then creates brain fog and all that, um, can happen without um, being short of breath. So I would suggest uh, to buy an oxygen saturation, you know, this is something you put on your finger, very easy to monitor. And if that goes below a certain level, it's all in there, then uh, I would go to the hospital. But but also, uh, even if you had it, because uh, I assume that some of the people on the audience will have had uh, the infection, I mean, uh, it's so prevalent, uh, that um, take the vaccine. Um, and But probably we only need one injection because uh, the, the first injection is like a booster because we already have immunity and we know already that that gives a fantastic boost of uh, our protection. But still, I took the both, um, partly also because I want a vaccine certificate and that uh, I can finally travel again. Yeah. Thank you for sharing this, this personal note with us. Um, and I'll turn over to uh, our board members, um, Fabio, Fabio Panatta, do you want to start? Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, Peter for an excellent seminar, very interesting, very clear. Um, you explained very, uh, very clearly how to prevent COVID, the efficacy of vaccines, and the constraints that we face in mass vaccination. But you did not say anything on how to cure COVID. So my question would be, uh, what is the state? Can you say as something on the state of research on possible medicines to cure uh, COVID once you are affected? Do you expect uh, any effective anti-inflammatory medicine to become available in the near future? Uh, no, Fabio, this is a very important question uh, because even with vaccines, some people will continue to be sick and we need that, uh, particularly those who are more vulnerable. And uh, uh, whereas I was, uh, let's say, pleasantly surprised with the, uh, how quickly we had uh, vaccines, uh, I was um, dis I've been disappointed by progress on treatment. I thought the opposite will happen, so I was wrong on that one. And uh, there are a few things we know. Um, that um, uh, you know, if you uh, apply, you give uh, very early on in the infection, before you typically would be hospitalized. Um, then, with an, uh, you want to kill the virus. An antiviral um, means like remdesivir, for example. It's a bit controversial, but that works. However, after that, uh, it's the virus is going. So, like in my case, I was in the hospital, um, uh, and thanks to oxygen, I made it. Um, but then I went home and then my trouble started. I had this long COVID for six months and, and then it's the immune response. And so you have to suppress the immunity. And there, there's a, a very cheap drug, dexamethasone, which has been shown to work. But up to now, we are still not really, uh, you know, very uh, effective in our treatment, although survival is much higher than a year ago. And that's more of an experience. You know, we know how to manage this clinically. Um, and so there's a lot of research going on. At the European level, there is now a network um, of, for clinical trials. There are two, one for treatment and one for um, uh, vaccines. And the problem was that up to recently, everybody was doing their small trial and, and the results were inconclusive. So we need to join forces there uh, on both sides. And, um, and I think time is everything. What may work in the beginning may not work at the end. And if you start suppressing immunity in the beginning, you may actually uh, make things worse. So it's, it's far more um, sophisticated than we originally thought. And also, 
for example, uh, thromboembolic events, since we know that that's uh, for AstraZeneca was in the news, is very they're very common. In uh, you know, I had this myself, and uh, then you have cardiac involvement, so you can prevent that. So it's yeah, but it's uh, something that uh, the, the where I'm most optimistic is that we will have so-called monoclonal antibody uh, therapies that kill the virus. Um, just as that, this is therapies that are being used also in cancer for the beginning, and then immune modulators afterwards. And, and there I would look at, there are a few uh, coming from, um, you know, treatments for autoimmune diseases. So, but it's, um, yeah, we, we need a far more systematic approach. And that's now what the, this clinical trials network is, is attacking. And I'm glad that, that the time should be over, that every clinician do their little trial and then and the results are inconclusive. That's the problem. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So we also have uh, Frank Alderson and uh, Philip Lane on the call. Frank or, or Philip, do you want to ask a question? Thanks a lot. Uh, extremely interesting. Um, my, uh, actually, I, uh, first I would like to ask, um, you know, this is the, the, to, to get this under control, of course, all these scientific things have to be done. But the, you, you made abundantly clear in your slides also that it's a question of, of people's trust in yeah. the virus and in the whole process. Now, of course, we are just central bankers and supervisors, but we have a, a, a you know, we have a strong presence in the in the debate. We, uh, we publish all the time. We, um, we give uh, interviews. Uh, we are called to the European Parliament. So from your perspective, uh, ideally, uh, what would we be saying? Um, and what would help as much as possible to get some control? Very fair question, <laughs> not an easy one. But I would say that, um, first of all, um, let's. I think you have a high credibility, and uh, so getting um, the right, uh, how to say, and the, the fine line is to say uh, there is hope, but folks at the moment, no time to relax. And uh, um, and maybe it's I'm just thinking aloud um, to uh, to think about some key messages uh, around this. That's something that we could uh, work on. I I did about a year ago with the Bank of England when Mark Carney was uh, still the you know the governor, and um, uh, and when the unknowns were even bigger. But I would say that uh, uh, and I give regularly um, uh, talks and uh, you know and in a dialogue with uh, investment companies and uh, uh, banks and all that not the central banks um, private equity just in, uh, and they all want to know how long is this going to take and uh, and where and so on and uh, but i think that the at the moment uh, we need to how to keep hope alive in the population uh, and let's say yes there is light at the end of the tunnel if we uh, can deploy the vaccine. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that, uh, um, yeah, I don't know enough about what's alive in your milieu, you know, what uh, how people look at it. Uh, I guess everybody's fed up with the, uh, you know, all the constraints and so on and, uh, uh, and, uh, and hoping that we will have a, 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 a nice summer. Um, but that may or may not be the case. I would say at this stage, probably the best would be push authorities in every country to, to be far better organized for vaccination. I mean, it's really not acceptable. Some countries started really seriously vaccinating or organizing themselves after Christmas or after New Year, honestly. Um, and this is, um, you know, it's not that uh, there was no warning. Uh, for me, that's hard to understand because it's also from a perspective of uh, in every country, if you get your population vaccinated, it gives you an enormous advantage economically, um, societal and, and everything. So uh, this is not just a public health issue, as you know. No. No, thanks. A good question. I need to think about it further. Yeah. Uh, Philip? Uh, maybe I'll just, again, jumping uh, beyond the pandemic, I mean, obviously in, in your career, you've spent a long time uh, dealing with AIDS uh, and with Ebola. So, so now you, you have this pandemic. So, so what, you know, from this, I mean, do you think uh, whether you personally or the profession of public health specialists 
uh, what a surprise to you in, in terms of uh, not so much as you say you were surprised by the vaccine progress, but how advanced economies uh, have, have dealt with this. Uh, has it been on net impressive or on net disappointing? Or, you know, do you come out of this believing that uh, the world, uh, you know, has done a reasonable job? Or, or do you more focus on the fact that it's, it's clearly uh, been quite limited in terms of global vaccination? And then, as you just said, uh, rollouts and communication issues in, in different countries. Yeah, Philip, I, something I think a lot about. And uh, one, I, for the last five, six years, I had one of my standard speeches to say so was, uh, are we ready for the next pandemic? And, uh, you know, and the answer was no. Uh, but, uh, but I made one mistake. I thought the next pandemic would be an influenza virus, one of those Spanish flu type of thing, which will happen one day. Uh, you know, that's, uh, that's not rocket science. Um, it's like the big one in California. One day they will have the earthquake, will wipe out Silicon Valley and everything. It could be tomorrow, it could be in a hundred years. So we can expect something influenza. So that's, but then I think um, your question is, yeah. And then there was a, a ranking of um, advance of, of economies, of countries. How well are they prepared? And what, number one was the U US, number two, the UK. Both have a very bad track record on this, how to deal with this epidemic. I mean, uh, with uh, 126 deaths in the, U uh, the UK, over half a million in the US and so on, and didn't do a good job. Um, whereas some countries that were very uh, low ranked, like Vietnam and uh, they said the Laos and, and Taiwan, and, uh, and they, they've done a really good job. And that's why I'm so fascinated. I, I, I go a lot to Singapore. I mean, I have, um, I'm there at the National University of Singapore and work with them. On, um, and in Japan, and uh, they had, uh, you know, the number of deaths is like, in some countries, less than 10. Vietnam is like, what, 100 million people, something like that. Um, and uh, when they have one case, it's panic and they do everything. Um, so we've not, we've not done well, uh, I think, and too slow. Um, and uh, um, so for me, my, the lesson is that uh, you always use a crisis to I know there is opportunities in there, and uh, you, uh, we need to um, get ready now for the longer term and for the next crisis. And that sounds a bit uh, far-fetched, but that's what also the uh, with the commission, this whole area of uh, being, um, you know, more self-sufficient than before. We we are really uh, enormous weaknesses. Um, what I had not anticipated at all, but that's more of your type of area is that uh, I okay the economic fallout yes but not the um, the geopolitical type of fallout and uh, that we're seeing at the moment that uh, I had uh, well it was not on my radar screen I mean uh, and so um, yeah and and it is not a solution that every country would say we're, I'm gonna uh, develop my own vaccines and so on it's not I mean the the global supply chains is, are, are enormous and for, I mean, are very complex. So that's, um, but I think now, um, if we don't know, uh, as individual nations, as regions, um, don't get our act together to better prepare it. Because like in Southeast Asia, East Asia and in Hong Kong and so on, they were, they had this SARS outbreak in 2003 and they put in place, um, let's say a fire brigade, uh, you know, in case some an outbreak would come up. They were well prepared, testing and tracing immediately. They had the laws, they had everything. And uh, what we've been doing is to set up the fire brigade when the house was on fire. That's, and, but it means that you need to invest and in, in the fire brigade and you hope that they will never have to be deployed. And that's in politically not so easy to to get. So that's what we need to do and, and uh, uh, at the moment. While of course we this should be part of the uh, the, the recovery plans for uh, for COVID. Otherwise, we'll go exactly through the same mess. Thank you. Is that okay? Well, yeah. Thank, thank you, you, Peter. Um, so we've come to the end of, of your talk. Uh, on behalf of the ECB, really want to thank you very much for your talk today. I think it has become crystal clear that as uh, 
that there should be more of these conversations between economists and health experts, and we should do definitely more of that. So thanks everyone also for joining, and until the next webinar. Um, wish you all the best, Peter.